For decades, the prospect of interplanetary travel has been restricted by fuel, but one organization is working to use light from the sun to travel to the stars. Three, two, one, zero. The Planetary Society recently began the first orbital test of their LightSail 2 spacecraft and it's already started sending back images. If solar sailing proves to be a viable means of propulsion, it could one day be used to explore the galaxy. To learn more, we brought in the Planetary Society's CEO, Bill Nye. Hi Bill, so congratulations on the successful mission. How's the light sailing going? Sailing is going very well. So it's, uh, we have a small spacecraft that's in orbit and it's getting a push from the sun uh, every orbit. It's, it's very exciting. You know, I was in uh, astronomy class in 1977, and Carl Sagan was talking about a solar sail mission. How long ago was that? 42 years ago? And now we finally pulled it off. We are sailing on sunlight. So can you tell us a little bit about how the light sail works? I happen to have a model right here. So this is uh, uh, one-tenth size of light sail too. So this is a three-unit cube sat here in the middle, and so it's 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters to give you perspective. That's almost but not quite as big as a conventional loaf of bread. And then this is 32 square meter sail, so it's about the size of a boxing ring. And I, even if you've never been to a boxing ring, you've seen one on the TV. So sunlight hits these solar panels here on the spacecraft by long tradition. The main part of a spacecraft is called the bus. The sails come out of the bus, out of the main cube, and they get to be relatively this big. And you can, this is the real material. Feel it, uh, Daniel, it's crazy thin, isn't it? Yeah, uh, get in from the edge. We have reinforced the edge to, to make it more durable for carrying. But see how wow. thin that is? It's like hardly much there. Thi yeah, much yeah. thinner than human hair. And you can see the um, ripstop feature in the sail material. So. Anyway, sunlight hits it and gives it a push. It's just out of your everyday experience that light can push something. And so we found that uh, the sails do billow a little bit, just like sails on a sailboat. And we found that because here on these panels, we have cameras, two cameras, and they're gorgeous. You see the shots of the earth below with the sail in the foreground. And so it'll fly, and we twist 90 degrees with every orbit because in here is what nowadays people call a momentum wheel. But you, might have used to, you might used to have called it a gyroscope. A spinning wheel can pr produce torque to twist the spacecraft in space. It's just amazing. And uh, this has been a human dream. So you could put this, a spacecraft like this, at an orbit closer to the sun than the Earth is. Now, the closer you are to the sun, the faster you go around. Mercury goes around faster than Venus, which goes around faster than the Earth. The Earth goes around faster than Mars, and so on. But what you could do is be as close to the sun as Venus, but because solar pressure is hitting your sail, you could keep in line or keep station with the Earth. And the practical application for that is monitoring what we call solar weather. If there's a coronal mass discharge of particles from the sun going at the Earth, you could get five or six hours warning, which could be priceless. In 2012, there was a solar a coronal mass ejection of particles that just missed the Earth, crossed the Earth's orbit about two weeks behind us as Earthlings. If that were to hit all our communication satellites and ground-based systems, it would be a catastrophic catastrophe. The other thing is, at, from that position in orbit uh, around the sun, you could watch for asteroids. As the saying goes, looking for an asteroid is like looking for a charcoal briquette in the dark. Very difficult to see at optical wavelengths, but in the infrared, in the, just a little above absolute zero in heat, you could find them. And there are hundreds of thousands of asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit. Some fraction of those would be the end of the world. So we want to find those. Worth looking out for. That's right. The preventable natural disaster. Very low probability, very high consequence. And so when this spacecraft is launched, it's about the size of a loaf of bread, it's right? It's actually smaller than a loaf of bread by a little bit. Yeah. And, but it unfurls to the size of a boxing ring. Right. Can you yeah. kind of walk me through the process of how that's done? A standard has emerged in spacecraft called a CubeSat, cubicle satellite. 
And uh, this happened because universities wanted to build these things. The Air Force is involved in this. And so you can go online and buy parts for cubical satellites. And the, the standard is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, X, Y, Z, a cube. Well, then the standards emerged, so we have a 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30. So it's what you call a three unit or three U cube set. And in there is a little, literally Swiss motor, like a Swiss watch, this very, very small motor on this crazy, small, very precisely made gear train. The booms are very much like tape measures. They're thin steel ribbons, and they wind up into this very small volume. They get very, almost flat. And so um, we have a motor that pushes them to get them started, and then it holds them back so they don't go zzzz out too fast and tear the sail. And this was something, this is a classic engineering problem. You'd think, you might think, if you wound up these springs, they would just deploy, just unspool on their own. But they don't because the material is curved, and when you flatten it, the curve changes and the stresses change. If we have software that commands the motor to unspool, the, to deploy the booms. Then the sails are attached to the end with little springs because the heating and cooling as you go around the sun is, makes the booms change length a little bit. And so we uh, figured that out too. And the crazy thing is the sails are made of this mylar material that's 20 microns. This is crazy. And so you can pack this huge shiny silver sail uh, into these very small volumes. It's origami. So this is a CubeSat and you've managed to raise the orbit of this CubeSat. Is this looking to the future? Is this something that could ever be used to one day bring humans to other planets or even other stars? Uh, humans, almost certainly not. The problem with humans is they're heavy and uh, we are not electronic. We need to drink and recover the water that we get rid of. And it's very, very, it's, it's a massive system to support a human. But going to another star system, a solar sail is really the only technology anybody can think of right now that would enable that. And what you would do, you'd build something like Light Sail 2, and you'd put it in orbit, and then you'd hit it or push it with laser beams. Then you would create laser beams here on Earth with an enormous amount of electricity and shoot them at the spacecraft and push it to another star system. And Keep in mind, if you were to do that, even a spacecraft the size of a postage stamp would show up in the Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri solar system four light years away. It would show up there with the energy comparable to a small nuclear weapon, like a Hiroshima-style bomb. And so if it were to hit something, well, okay, we're from Earth, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I sent you this bullet that's enough to just, you know, it's a great way to say destroy hello. <laughs> a city. Yeah, so I'm not saying it would. It's just don't get carried away, everybody. It's like not a solved problem. And the other thing that everybody's really enchanted about is exploring nearby space. And by nearby, we mean the Kuiper belt, you know, where all these icy objects are orbiting the sun with a solar sail that got out there because it could get up to 100 kilometers a second. So what you would do is have a solar sail that might have the same shape as light sail 2, but the materials it would be made of would be able to hold their shape, their integrity, uh, close to the sun. So you'd, you'd send the spacecraft in near the sun, and the, you'd have so many photons hitting it so strongly that it would push it out at 100 kilometers and you could get out to way out in the solar system relatively fast. That technology doesn't exist right now. The materials don't exist right now. But the longest journey starts with but a single step. So we like to think of light sail one and two as part of the overall mission of advancing space science and exploration. That's what we do at the Planetary Society. Citizen funded flight by light. Well, congratulations on taking that first step, and thanks so much for joining us, Bill. Thank you, Daniel.